Welcome back to Majority Rules. I'm Lauren Leader here for episode seven of our show, which has been so much fun to do. We've had a series of just totally amazing women guests. Um, I guess at some point we'll probably have a guy. But for now, I'm really enjoying having all of these amazing women. And today is no exception. I am very excited to have my friend and mentor, uh, Anita McBride, who I will introduce shortly. But she has been a huge figure in sort of shaping how I think about not just um, women in politics, but very specifically first ladies. And I've, mm -hmm. I'll talk more about that with her, but she's really shaped the way that I think about their role and has challenged my thinking in ways that I think are really important. And so I'm super excited to talk to her about her new book uh, about the first ladies. So she'll join us in a minute. But as we always do on Majority Rules, we're gonna keep talking lady politics this week because there is a lot to talk about. Um, first and foremost, uh, this week, the Supreme Court heard incredibly important arguments uh, for in the case, uh, the question of access to the abortion pill, mefeprestone, which right now is about 63% of all abortions in this country uh, are induced through the use of this combination of drugs, mefeprestone, and the other one, which I can never pronounce, so I'm not going to try. Uh, but what's really interesting about this case is a few things. First of all, I think it really speaks to the sort of ideological divides, uh, even among women, which is fascinating because although the majority of women, 80, 90 percent in most polls, support, support abortion access, including among women who are pro-life and themselves would probably choose not to have an abortion. Um, in this case, both of the lawyers arguing before the court were women, um, the, the solicitor general and, of course, uh, the lawyer who have brought the lawsuit on behalf of uh, doctors who claim that the abortion pill is unsafe. What I think is really interesting about this case, and obviously there's a lot of high emotions around it because it is such a, it is really sort of the last point of access for many women in the 24 plus states that now have either restricted or banned abortion. The abortion pill is now available through telehealth and states like New York, where I live, have created safe harbor provisions since the end of Roe that enable doctors to prescribe and mail pills into those states, which is really what one of the core questions is. But what I think has been overlooked a little bit in the coverage, and you know, the coverage did get a little bit sideswiped by the, you know, sort of marginalized a little bit this week because of the catastrophe in Baltimore, which I'll speak about in a minute. But it is so important because this case would represent the first time in history that a court would overrule the opinion of the Food and Drug Administration of the FDA. And I definitely find that alarming. I really worry about that, that judges, are judges equipped to make medical decisions, which of course I think they're not. It's part of why I think we are where we are in terms of some of the horrible medical complications that women in states that have banned abortion are facing. But really interesting interchange between Justice Alito during the oral arguments who asked this question, is the FDA infallible? Isn't it possible that they've made a mistake? Justices Alito and Thomas for sure seem inclined uh, to side on the part of the litigants and to ban mefeprestone, um, invoking the Comstock Act, which is like equally controversial. We could talk more about that later, but uh, really interesting that Katanji Brown Jackson then asked the question, are judges scientists and do judges have the medical experience and judgment to decide whether or not something is safe? It seems like for now, uh, folks are probably safe because most of the justices, including interestingly, Neil Gorsuch, who did uh, side with the majority, of course, in the Dobbs case and uh, overturning uh, the Roe decision, seemed very skeptical about the standing of the litigants in this case. In other words, they didn't individually seem to have been harmed in any way. And so there is a real question about whether or not the case has standing. I suspect it will get thrown out, but it is a really interesting uh, and critical case to continue watching for those of us who are very focused on these issues, which is, of course, many, many Americans. Um, in other women's political news this week, um, incredible, interesting victory in Alabama, a seat that was held by Republicans for a very long time, uh, was flipped to a Democrat in their state legislature. And that was really, um, it seems in large part because of the ban on IVF that the court in um, Alabama ruled and, um, you know, establishing this question about whether or not uh, embryos are people or children. Fascinating that that issue alone seems to have made the difference. And the woman who won, won by like monster margins, 26 points. 
So really interesting about the continuing salience of abortion and family planning as an issue in this upcoming election. The Biden administration is certainly hoping that that's going to bode well for them. But TBD. Uh, in other lady politics news, I'm really fascinated that uh, RFK Jr. picked a lady, a lady running mate, Nicole Shanahan, who has zero political experience. She's actually never run for office. She's never done politics. There's a lot of very interesting stuff floating around about her. Um, first of all, she is the person who bankrolled the very controversial Kennedy ad during the Super Bowl, which pissed off the Kennedy family royally because it essentially linked him with former President Kennedy, something the family does not approve of. The family uh, are adamant supporters of Joe Biden. They want nothing to do with RFK Jr., which is a fascinating family dynamic. Can you imagine what Christmases are like at the Kennedy house right now? Boy, I think my family's complicated. That's a lot. So anyway, but interestingly, because Nicole seems to have sided, she's kind of trying to play it both ways on the vaccine stuff. She thinks it should be a discussion. She's not really sure she opposes vaccines. But the big question is, is she the is she the running mate really because of her wallet, which seems to be the implications? And she's bankrolling his campaign, um, has a lot of money. Um, there's also a lot of stuff which I really dislike and don't appreciate floating around about her personal life which is regardless of whether or not you support RFK Jr., she did, she was married to Sergey Brin, that's part of the resource of her money. She did apparently have an affair with Elon Musk, which is apparently what brought their marriage to an end. But like, I get so uncomfortable the second the political discourse on Twitter or X or anywhere else starts talking about women's personal lives and their relationships. And I know this stuff is fair game, but yeah, yuck, I don't like it. It makes me really squeamish. It's just not, go after her for something else. That one just annoys me. I don't like it. But, you know, it is a real question about RFK Jr. Uh, you know, talk about a potential spoiler for Biden. I don't think it's an accident that a lot of his donors are Trump people. Uh, it's, a, it's a worry and he's kind of a nut job. And I, I just, it's not good. He's now trying these long shot bids to get on a bunch of ballots around the country. Um, they now have the money, it seems, to do that, which is a lot of money. So uh, TBD will be watching, but another woman enters yeah. enters the arena. We will watch and see. So I want to turn to um, my guest because she's been waiting patiently while I rant about the news. And uh, I am really thrilled to have my dear friend, and as I said before, truly someone I consider a mentor, Anita McBride. Um, Anita served in three presidential administrations. Her last role was uh, with George W. Bush and First Lady Laura Bush. Um, she has been a tireless advocate for the legacy of First Ladies and has written a number of books. She has a new one out that we're going to talk about in a moment. And she also is the director of what I think is like the coolest program around, which mm -hmm. is the First Ladies Initiative mm -hmm. uh, in the School of Public Affairs at American University. <clears throat> I know Anita and I'm blessed to know her for a few reasons. One, because some of my board members who are former members of the Bush administration it, it introduced us long ago but also because of my time in this very, very special program, which anyone who knows me know I talk about all the time, which is the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program, which I did in 2018, uh, which is this amazing leadership program that teaches leadership through the lens of four presidencies, including both Presidents Bush and Bush Senior, Bush W. Bush, 40, 41 and 43. And uh, it was really a privilege and a gift. And so, Anita, I'm so excited to talk to you about the First Ladies. Mm, Welcome to the Dirty Room. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. That's so interesting to listen to your wrap up of the top line items in the news. Well, as you know, I'm passionate about the role that women play in I know. everything politics. And I will acknowledge that I feel like I have had like a complete sort of about face and sort of a schooling about the first ladies in the last few years. And, you know, one thing that happens, I think, for so many of us is we start to realize like the sexism that is so ingrained in our society that we just accept it. Mm -hmm. And it takes a challenge mm -hmm. to turn it upside down. And for me, that was really around Nancy Reagan. Mm -hmm. um, 
as you know, I grew up in Washington mm -hmm. during the Reagan years in a very de in a democratic household. <laughs> we were no, we didn't know any Republicans except for right. Nick Calio, who lived down the street, but we didn't talk <laughs> to him because he was a Republican. And uh, and DC was so divided. But you right. know, the way in which the popular culture spoke about Nancy Reagan in my childhood was so derisive mm -hmm. and so um, unfair. And it, it's Julia Swig's, right, Julia? No, it was um, Karen Tumulty's book. Karen Tumulty's book. Karen Tumulty's book, sorry. Very illustrative. That like completely turned it upside down. So, so mm -hmm. talk to me about mm -hmm. why you're so passionate about advocating for the legacies of the First Ladies and mm -hmm. what you think people don't appreciate about right. that. Right. Well, you've actually just brought up such a great example as to why this this book, not only mine, but many others, and just the growing amount of scholarship around First Ladies and their contributions, why it's so important, because so many of the things that they have done, programs, initiatives that they led, but legacies that they have left that continue to live on, are underreported or under underappreciated. I think a couple of things. One, you know, for me, why? Why am I spending so much time on this uh, topic? You know, I had a front row seat to history, Lauren. You know that, and I I saw firsthand just how multifaceted this role is, and it's a role with no definition. No position description at all, still to this day, not in our constitution, not codified, and not salaried, which I am actually supportive of, because I think the minute then you are on the federal payroll, there are a whole series of obligations and requirements for you that make wow. it less flexible for you to pick and choose what you want to do. So the minute a president is inaugurated, that's an automatic, powerful platform that's given to the president's spouse. And just peeling back the layers of the, the book that we wrote, which actually started as a textbook mm -hmm. in the fall, uh, fall of 2023, the first textbook ever on this topic. And we tested it out yeah. in a number of universities, small and large around the country. And to a fault, every student said the same thing, male or female. Why did we never learn this before? So these are these untold stories in history. And if we want to talk about inclusive history in our country, we have to include these women. A hundred percent. That's our North Star. Perfect timing in Women's History Month, which I only yes. recently learned was established actually specifically to help fill in the gaps in women's history in this country. Exactly. And in 1974, I think Women's exactly. History Month was established in the state of California to help fill in the gaps on history. So I'm obsessed with this. I love the stories. I, you know, for me, um, it was not just, it was Nancy Reagan, but also L Lady Bird Johnson, sure. and, you know, who, and actually I think it was Laura Bush that wrote about how in her time, Lady Bird was sort of dismissed as like the person who likes flowers. Yeah. <laughs> but really that she, which of course she did, and she planted these sure, yeah. gardens and public spaces all over, but she was really a fierce environmentalist and conservationist. Absolutely. And, you know, and a huge asset for LBJ in the South. And she, you know, famously went on that, you know, on a tour to speak in, in the segregated South. But what are, for you, who stands out most for you in this First Ladies? Maybe it's the ones that you had the privilege of serving. But like, what do you think has been, who are the, what are the sure. conversations that have been really overlooked that like stick with you? Well, you know, it's very interesting in the book, you know, how we wrote, it's not all uh, biographical. It's not all chronological. Some of it is thematic uh, as well. And uh, only three first ladies get their own chapter. One is Eleanor Roosevelt, who, of course, to this day remains the most activist first lady in, in our history and really created a model for others to follow. Not that everyone did. Uh, mm -hmm. Lady Bird Johnson, of course, gets her own too because it was the it was the return to the activist model and did things like you said that train trip through the South that she took in the 1964 campaign to support her husband, but really to support the new legislation that was just signed on civil rights that was deeply unpopular. Do you know that she did that trip because it was deemed too dangerous? for LG, LBJ as the president to go. And a train car went 15 minutes ahead of her at every stop 
just in the case of there being, you know, a bomb on the tracks. So incredible acts of, of, of courage. The other um, first lady that gets her own chapter is Michelle Obama, for obvious reasons, completely changed what an inflection point yeah. in, in the country. Because she's still but, one of those popular figures in the world, like she is, right? She winds up on the top of those lists every year. Well known everywhere. And again, you know, she was the first first lady in the truly complete digital age. And was able, and that's a, that is a topic in our book too. The impact of communications over time from first ladies who didn't even have the right to vote had no role on the public stage and worked in the background. Though many presidents wouldn't have been president without um, their wives, even way back then. Uh, but the growing amount of uh, press and media and communications and how that contributed for a first lady to be more well known for the work that they are doing, but also be more criticized too, because mm -hmm. they're more in the public eye. But Mrs. Obama, of course, used every tool available to her in the digital and social media age mm -hmm. uh, and became, of course, a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, I love this because I do think that there is, it's amazing how, you know, every first lady seems to face kind of the similar dismissive critique, yes. right? They, they're, it's very difficult for them to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And it's it's shocking to me. I, I was at the White House, I spoke about it on the last show, I was at the White House mm -hmm. last week for- um, For the Jill Women's Hathaway. History Month, right? Yes, and for their announcement of this incredibly important women's health initiative yes. mm -hmm. that, um, that Jill Biden is championing. And it is getting attention, but it is, mm -hmm. it's just every time it feels mm -hmm. so there's something about it, these first lady initiatives that are so powerful that mm -hmm. have the potential to change the world in real ways. And yet, like just don't get taken seriously. You know what? So here's the thing. Here's another model of, yeah. of a first lady who was very substantive and very serious, Rosalind Carter. And it was mm -hmm. very frustrating to her. Here she's chairing the president's mental health commission, something she had done as first lady of Georgia, so well steeped in the knowledge uh, on, on the topic. And she was frustrated that the coverage, you know, she got was more about the fact that she stopped serving alcohol in the in the White House at, at uh, some events. Um, so your example is true. They all have faced it. Probably the first lady who's been dismissed the most in modern times was Pat Nixon. Her husband's advisors were so dismissive of her, yet she was an incredibly impactful first lady, the most traveled first lady in history, 81 oh, wow. countries, oh. the only first lady to be given the title personal representative of the president when she traveled overseas, even though all first ladies, modern first ladies have traveled representing our country. But this was an official uh, designation, did more to open up the White House then even before Americans with Disabilities Act and had ramps installed into the White House so people could um, have access to the White House that were in wheelchairs, wow. did tours at night for working women. More women were going into the workforce, but to have the White House available, tours for the blind, programs that were printed in foreign languages so that from people all over the world that came to visit the White House could read about the rooms that they were in. Huge proponent of the ERA. Yeah. as as Betty Ford was, um, you know, too. So that's one of the topics we talk about in the book, First Lady Success, is tied to not only how the media projects them, uh, but also the support that they're getting internally in the White House, from the president to the president's advisors. I'm happy to say um, for Laura Bush, you know, she had president's complete support, and that trickled down to the staff and yeah. it makes it makes a difference. Well, and it seems like, I mean, that was my big takeaway about Nancy Reagan too, yeah. is that the nasty, a lot of the like really nasty press about her, you mm -hmm. know, the stuff that of course, you know, anyone in my generation remembers, mm -hmm. um, the, the nasty press, some of it came from within the White House that Reagan's yes. own advisors were so resentful of her and just frustrated at her influence that they actually actively worked to undermine her. Which we didn't you know there were terrible know. leaks, of course, and 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 you know a couple of things about that. First of all, she was singularly focused on her husband's legacy, and for a woman who came out of the world of communications, 
film, you know, that industry that projects an image, she was so not focused on on her own and let let herself be defined and then did some things, you know, in the beginning that were not rolled out properly. Yes, it is true. When the Reagans came, there was no state dinner service to be able to do a full state Mm -hmm. state dinner. That China, yes, that she selected, which every first lady since has used, it's everyone's favorite, um, was not paid for by government money, but that it was paid for by the White House Historical Association, the private funding arm founded by Jackie Kennedy, which is a great legacy of a first lady. But that got so spun out of control. The fancy Nancy moniker just stayed with her the entire time. And it really wasn't until President Reagan died of Alzheimer's and the recognition by people around the country of how much you know she did to care to take care of him and the things that she tried to do policy wise in the country right. was for stem cell research. Well, and I was gobsmacked that she had such a huge role in a lot of, in what Reagan is, of course, most famous for the Soviet, the Soviet Union. Union and the yeah. extent to which she pushed behind the scenes for him to take a more moderate tone and reach out to Gorbachev and all of these things, which, of course, had vast implications for history, but she was never given. Never given until up. Karen's book. Until Karen's book up. really peeled back those layers. And she did, and Mrs. Rake, to the point you made about the advisors yeah. who were undermining her. I mean, ultimately, she had a hand in pushing all those people out. Oh, interesting. That's so fascinating. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love this stuff. Like, I could do this all day long. <laughs> I know. There's... Because I think also, like, the, there are these sort of background figures in a strange way yes. in our to our history, and they should not be. And it it drives me nuts that it's not. Just well, we're working person. on it. The good news is we're working on it, right? You're doing it. You're doing at the it. university level and then in popular, you know, uh, literature. I'm very heartened by the responses that we've been getting and the the book tour that I've been on. The presidential libraries, which you know have uh, such an important role to play to yeah. getting stories elevated and out there. But even universities, talking universities and to students has been great. Small and large events around the country, we're getting there. And then, of course, there's been some, um, you know, series, television uh, series that, and some of those have a a narrative that's not entirely accurate. But, you know, if it causes people to want to learn more, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you before we wrap about the first yeah. one. So, because it was controversial, it wasn't like a great show. They didn't do a great job. But you know, the show, the Showtime one. Yeah, you know, which with had great, you know, sort of media rollout, yeah. a great, you know, potential. Um, but it didn't do very well, and I don't think I it's you know coming back. And it's too bad because they sure had headline talent. Uh, but but again, you know, it was and there's a narrative that's being pushed that's not entirely um, historically accurate. Yeah. I mean, it happened. I know a lot of the historians were really grouchy about it. Right, yeah. right, like, exactly. You're gonna, you're gonna grouchy, that's a good word. Grouchy. I know a few historians, they were grouchy. <laughs> <laughs> So, Anita, just tell everyone where they can find the book. I know it's available on Amazon and everywhere else. We will put up the graphic for the book. Yes, it's on uh, Amazon. It's on Barnes & Noble. It's it's available directly through the publisher, uh, cognella.com. It is at the White House Historical Association. Also one of my favorite places. Is uh, selling it. And if people get get it and like it and want to do a review on Amazon, we welcome that. Again, our North Star is to get these stories in as many hands as as possible. These stories deserve to be told. They do. And it's such important work. And I just wanted to say thank you again for all the you, that you have like opened my consciousness Uh, and expanded my thinking. And, you know, my time in the Presidential Leadership Scholars mm -hmm. Program was like one of the most important formative experiences of my life and always will be. And like, it's just, there's something extraordinary about what history, how history and really understanding history fully shapes the way you see everything differently. And I don't know that I appreciated that until I've had the privilege of getting to know you and mm-hmm. other amazing sort of witnesses to history who've helped me think about it. So thank well, you. Well, it gives you perspective, doesn't it? It's helpful. You know, it really is. Well, you certainly embraced that opportunity at Presidential Leadership Scholars and have paid it forward in a big way. So congratulations yeah. to you. 
Thank you, Anita. Thanks for being with us. I appreciate it a lot. That was my awesome conversation with Anita McBride, one of my favorite people and uh, just sort of extraordinary life having been that close to history, worked for three presidents and three administrations, which is just remarkable. And um, Anita is one of those people in Washington who just everybody reveres and loves and uh, she's just a gift. And that I really encourage everyone to go read this book. It is so fascinating to think about these extraordinary women that have been in our midst all this time and that we've overlooked and not really given much credit to. And um, it's been a real eye opener for me. Um, so the presidential season in full swing, a uh, huge fundraiser for President Biden with Bush, I mean, excuse me, with Bush, oh my God, it is not with Bush, with Clinton and Obama at Radio City Music Hall, uh, which has raised $25 million, the largest fundraising total for any one night, one day in presidential history. So uh, we're in full swing. Obviously, New Yorkers love their Democratic presidentials, and we'll be turning out at Radio City uh, to haul in the cash for President Biden. So lots coming, um, obviously continuing to follow all of the ongoing challenges around abortion, the abortion pill, the Supreme Court, uh, women in politics, the vice president, all the things which we will continue to cover here on Majority Rules uh, now and through the election. And uh, I encourage you to keep watching and to share us out on all the socials. I am Lauren Leader, and this is Majority Rules. Thanks for tuning in.